So first of all, thank you all for joining us today. And the, today is our, uh, I think, second week or the, of this webinar series. And uh, I would like to just briefly mention and welcome you all, uh, but also like to welcome our speaker, Professor Kelsey Hatzel uh, from Princeton University. And uh, Kelsey and I, uh, I think, know each other quite a bit for the last few years. We also happen to be Penn State alum in some sense. Uh, and uh, we have been working also on certain, on a certain aspects of solid state batteries. But uh, without that, you know, with, with a little bit of the brief introduction, I would like to hand it over to Shishmita, but I would like to personally extend a very warm welcome uh, to otherwise a very cold, uh, you know, Midwest today. So Kelsey, thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, Shishmita, please take it over. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Mukherjee, for the introduction. So welcome, everyone, and welcome to the webinar series we organized by the ECS Purdue student chapter. So we have, uh, like, we, I see a lot of new faces today or, like, not of new students. So those of you who don't know us, this is the current executive board we have. Uh, we have Professor Mukherjee as our faculty advisor. So we had started a fall webinar series uh, like last semester, and we had a great li list of great speakers from industries, academias, and national labs. So continuing with our webinar series, this semester we have a theme of women in electrochemical sciences and engineering. So we had Dr. Rachel Carter from US NRL in the last talk. And um, just for your information, we will have Dr. Navneeti Rajput from Stony Brook University for the next talk. So now it's my great, uh, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce our second speaker of this series, Dr. Kelsey Hetzel from Princeton University. Dr. Hetzel earned her PhD in material sciences and engineering at Drexel, Drexel University, her MS in mechanical engineering from Pennsylvania State University, and her BS and BA in engineering and economics from Swarthmore College. Dr. Hetzel's research group works on understanding phenomena at solid liquid and solid solid interfaces and works broadly in energy storage and conversion. Dr. Hitzel is the recipient of several awards, including the ORAU Poway Junior Faculty Award, NSF Career Award, ECS Toyota Young Investigator Award, finalist for the BAS Volkswagen Science in Electrochemistry Award, the Ralph Buck Robinson Award from MRS and Sloan Fellowship in Chemistry. The talk of her title is Engineering Interfaces and Interfaces for All Solid State Batteries. Now, without further ado, we'll turn the time over to Dr. Hetzel. So, Dr. Hetzel, if you can start sharing your screen. Okay, again. Oh, okay, okay, got it. Um, right. Okay, great. Do you see it? Yes, thank okay. you. All right, um, well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction um, and the invitation to speak here today. Um, again, one of the many great things or one of the few great things about COVID is we're experiencing really bad weather here in Nashville. Um, and so um, we didn't have to travel, which is great. Um, so um, I'm happy to be here. And this is a very, I hope to um, be starting an ECS chapter at Princeton. Um, so I'm very excited to see all these different opportunities or these different efforts that are put out by different universities led by the students. So this is really um, a great uh, forum. Uh, so uh, to get started, um, there's a wide range of different energy storage systems uh, across multiple scales um, that we can design for them for, um, from portable electronics to um, which most prominently was awarded the Nobel Prize in um, uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry um, about two years ago uh, for the innovations in lithium ion battery. And most people are very familiar with their relationship um, with their phone um, or their computer. Um, but beyond um, portable electronics, there's a wide range of different applications that we want to address. Um, from electric vehicles. Um, right now, there's a big push in terms of how do we um, 
diminish CO2 emissions being there's three prominent ways. Um, transportation is the number one uh, way that we can address CO2 emissions. Um, power systems or power plants are number two and then methane emissions at um, gas flaring is number three. Um, but transportation is really I'm going to be a great way to diminish CO2 emissions. Uh, and lastly, um, grid energy storage or energy storage, long duration energy storage, um, which can store uh, energy from the from the tens of hours to seasons is, is really um, quite an open area. Um, but as you can imagine, as we go to larger and larger scale, the cost or the price point for your device becomes more um, paramount um, in terms of adoption uh, in application. And today I'm gonna to be really talking about the opportunity for um, solid state batteries for electric vehicles. Uh, in particular, if we can uh, introduce energy dense anodes, we can potentially um, design uh, batteries to have longer driving range. Um, and of course, um, charging rate, um, both of these are things that the consumer is really interested in. Um, and it is often the barrier for e someone purchasing an EV over a traditional IC engine. Uh, so um, you all are electric chemists, so I can kind of skip through this, um, but um, typically um, we use intercalation cathodes as um, the cathode for a lithium ion battery, um, and we'll use a graphite or um, alloy um, type uh, composite graphite and silicon as the anode. Um, but there's a significant interest to using lithium metal because it has a lower thermodynamic potential. Um, so we can eke out slightly higher um, voltage windows um, when paired with lithium cathodes. Um, but um, there's a significant challenge with introducing uh, lithium metal anode and pr it's primarily its reversibility and safety when combined with most liquid electrolytes. Um, and I like to show this, I hope this is an experiment that you should not do at home, um, but this is a battery going under um, kind of being kind of uh, bombarded by a nail. Um, and as you can see, the more it's exposed to air and ambient atmosphere, it can explode and catch fire. Uh, and so this is a significant problem. Um, and you might have been familiar with news kind of, um, there was a submarine a couple years ago in Argentina that went missing and they it's presumed because of battery um, malfunction. Um, you might have heard about the Boeing or the Galaxy Note. Um, all of these issues with batteries is something that um, is important and as we think about putting hundreds and hundreds of batteries in vehicles, um, it's um, unacceptable for um, widespread implementation. Uh, and so the flammability is largely uh, dictated um, by the solvent in the liquid electrolyte. Um, so typically um, in electrolyte, we take a salt and we dissolve it in a liquid solvent. Um, and um, that salt is what we call binary um, because you have the presence of both an anion and cation um, in your system. Uh, and so when we're designing electrolytes, we typically look to two properties um, in particular, two transport properties. We think about ionic conductivity, which is how quickly an ion can move within a solid or solution. Uh, and we think about transference number, which is how efficient an ion can move in a solid or a solution. And so in the case of a binary electrolyte where you have two charge carriers, um, this transference number is going to be less than one. Um, but if we implement a um, solid ion conductor uh, where we have only, where ion transport um, in a solid occurs um, through the presence of vacancies or defects, we um, only have a single charge carrier. And so we can have a transference number um, that is equivalent to one. Uh, and so typically the ionic conductivity in a solution is much higher um, than that of a solid. Um, but recently there have been there has been significant work um, in the inorganic materials chemistry community to come up with many, many families of solids that are showing ionic conductivity similar um, to liquid electrolytes. 
Uh, and so um, our group has been really motivated um, by lithium metal um, and how it interacts with um, interacts at solid solid interfaces. Uh, and uh, this is just gives you an example of these dendrites or um, that can form at a liquid electrolyte. And this is largely governed by the formation of concentration gradients in electrolytes where the transference number is greater is less than one. Um, and so there's been a lot of work um, pioneered by Monroe um, and Newman, which have suggested that if I could just have a solid, a strong solid electrolyte, I could suppress um, this formation of a dendrite or filament. Um, and I could reversibly deposit and uh, dissolute lithium um, at a lithium metal electrode, um, which we could we have a very challenging time doing this with liquid electrolytes. Uh, but in actuality, this isn't the case um, because the dynamics of these buried solid solid interfaces are much more complex. Um, mainly, um, you have a solid electrolyte that resides at a chemical potential. And this chemical potential is going to be different, most likely, than the anode and cathode. And that um, can drive the chemical decomposition, um, as well as irregular interfaces that make, um, in particular, plating and stripping lithium metal very challenging. Uh, um, in addition to those problems. Um, we can have chemomechanical stresses um, that happen in the cathode over oscillating, um, over charge and discharge, and that can lead to non-uniform stress generation. Uh, we can also have the formation of pores if we strip the lithium metal um, too quickly, um, where we can't overcome mechanic mechanics, we can form these voids or pores and interface. Um, and both of these challenges um, we don't know much about, um, primarily because these exist at buried solid solid interfaces. Um, and I just wanted to point out, see. Um, some work from Purdue that has been instrumental in inspiring some of our work, um, where uh, Partha's group was really um, quite, had a very nice paper which highlighted um, the opportunities for stable um, electrode deposition, um, showing that um, if you have preferential deposition from a region which is under tensile too compressive, you can form these dendrites. Um, but if we can change where the lithium preferred to deposit, we can get a stable um, deposition. Um, and in this paper, um, this theoretical paper, it shows that um, really this comes down to a property um, of the solid electrolyte um, in terms of having a tailoring the molar volume mismatch and therefore controlling the kinetics of deposition or dissolution or changing the properties of the solid electrolyte in terms of the stress conductivity, whether a um, lithium ion prefers to play it out from a high energy state or compressive state to a tensile or vice versa. Um, and so um, this gave us a kind of a platform for understanding how can we design electrolytes um, for both transport and kinetic properties for stable electro deposition. Um, and so um, with this, um, my group has been really focused on understanding two questions and, and they largely um, fall under the guise of degradation mechanisms in solid electrolytes um, as a result of lithium metal. Uh, the first failure mechanism is the formation of these filament growths that can grow across your solid electrolyte and short them. Um, and this other secondary um, failure mode um, that I'm not gonna really talk about today um, is really how can we detect isolated lithium plating? Um, there's been several works which have suggest that while a solid electrolyte in theory should be um, electrically insulating, in fact, that's not the case. Um, and there's an opportunity where lithium can plate from an ionic to a metal uh, form within the solid electrolyte. Uh, and so my group has been really interested in understanding how microstructural heterogeneity um, governs these two mechanisms. And microstructural heterogeneity takes multiple, um, happens at multiple length scales, um, but also it takes different forms in the solid electrolytes. You have flaws, which just could be like um, 
a de- uh, c- contamination in your material. You can have grains. Um, we can have pores and delamination, just non-uniform contact. And this is an LMA at the device level, um, whereas this is at the materials level. Uh, and so the research questions we're trying to um, answer is how can we build uh, or how can we probe um, solid solid interfaces at equilibrium and non equilibrium? Um, do kinetically unstable interfaces drive degradation mechanisms or does heterogeneity in solid electrolyte microstructure play a role? Uh, and finally, how can we make solid state batteries? Um, there's a lot of introdu- a lot of great hope in solid state batteries because we can use energy dense anodes. Uh, and so that means that we can make energy dense batteries, which is great for potentially driving, increasing the driving range. Um, but if you don't know how to make them at giga scales, that's going to be um, a non-starter for that particular application. Um, maybe not for portable electronic applications, but certainly you need to get to giga scale capacities for um, uh, electric vehicle applications. Uh, and so my group does a lot of work on advanced characterization, um, looking at tools that can probe um, these battery systems out of equilibrium. Um, our favorite probe is x-rays. Um, there's a lot of really great work on NMR and neutron depth profiling I'm not going to talk about today. Um, the, the, the opportunity for these two techniques is that you can resolve lithium metal. Um, and um, But the the trade-off is often temporal resolution of your experiment as well as spatial resolution. Uh, And that brings me to x-rays. We like x-rays because you can build experiments that are closer to reality, meaning the size of your experiment. We also like x-rays because the temporal resolution is quite good. Um, You can get 3D um, images in less than a minute. and depending on what resolution you're interested in, um, but typically at the sub-micron resolution, um, you can get minute scans, which is great. Um, uh, and um, di- every material uh, interacts differently with an X-ray beam. Uh, and so what I've highlighted here um, is this is Beer's law, where the intensity or flux through your material is going to be a function of the attenuation, um, which is a material, this is materials driven. Um, and X is, again, that experimental design that we're considering. Um, so if I want to design an experiment to look at a battery at real length scales, um, I have to consider this. um, And I also have to consider the materials that I'm using. And what you can see here is at different photon, these are characteristic examples of solid electrolytes. And we can see um, that as I get to attenuation scales that are of interest, I have to go to exceedingly high energy levels to probe these material systems. Uh, And so this is um, really motivates um, why we go to a synchrotron. Um, yes, you can do um, work on X-ray sources in the lab scale, um, but to get the um, intensity um, and statistics necessary to, for images, um, you would have to run very, very long experiments. Um, but um, by going to a synchrotron, we can run very quick experiments. Uh, And so um, this um, is just an example of a solid electrolyte with lithium metal on top. Um, And we've been able, this is just pulling the, what is the voids or porous region from the um, bulk structure. Uh, We like to go and use synchrotron X-ray tomography so we can look at um, material properties um, and qualitatively and both quantitatively. Um, And so um, these images while alone, um, definitely can tell us something. Um, they, um, at best, um, they're qualitative. Um, and one thing we've been looking at recently is how we can track dynamics at lithium metal interfaces. Um, one of the challenges with tracking lithium metal with x-rays is x-rays don't have chemical specificity um, naturally. um, Although different materials will attenuate differently, um, it's hard to resolve lithium metal from other low um, 
molecular weight materials um, because they'll or any material that attenuates in a similar fashion. Uh, And so uh, recently we've been looking at um, just tracking the lithium metal at the solid electrolyte interface. And what you can see here um, in this video is how the morphology of the lithium metal or the gray scale in the lithium metal during charging and discharging um, changes pretty dramatically. And there's actually quite a lot of um, qualitative features that we can see um, just even with our naked eye. Uh, And we're interested in tracking the lithium metal um, because non-uniform ionic flux or pores formed during stripping are thought to be nuclei for the formations of lithium metal. So if we can track the lithium metal, um, we potentially can um, start to answer or resolve some of these mechanistic questions um, related to lithium electrokinetics and how it changes um, against a solid electrolyte in comparison to a liquid electrolyte. Uh, And so um, uh, this is kind of, these images here are some recent papers which shows the state of the art for looking at lithium pores or voids um, where you can strip for long periods of time and extract the lithium metal and see how the morphology changes. Unsurprisingly, under extreme conditions, we can get a pretty ragged um, morphology. Um, And then Peter Bruce's group, they used um, um, x-ray tomography um, to resolve a poor formation at lithium metal interface. Um, But kind of motivated by this um, fact and this, our intrinsic motivation to move toward quantitative, um, using images as the means to quantify uh, material information, um, we were looking at how can we um, quantify lithium metal and how, what, how reliable are these measurements using synchrotron uh, techniques. Uh, and so uh, for those of you who have not done synchrotron x-ray tomography, you get these radiographs or 2D images. Um, and this is the pristine electrode. This is the plated electrode with your naked eye. You can see the formation of um, you know, a plated region. Um, and then this is the same um, region upon stripping. And so you can, we can see how there's like during plating and stripping, this morphological change in our lithium metal. Um, if we wanted to analyze in three dimensions, we have to binarize our image, um, which basically is a, uh, where, we, uh, where the human in the loop or the human doing the analysis picks an arbitrary pixel and says that attenuation of that grayscale means that I am a void or I am lithium metal. Um, So we can discern the two phases. Um, And so when I binarize the system, we see um, essentially all the stuff in gray is the lithium metal. All the stuff in black is basically things that are what it presumably pores or um, like uh, in this case, maybe non-uniform interface. Um, however, there's a lot of variability um, from person to, to group to group on how you do this segmentation and binarization. Um, and so we um, recently used um, um, uh, open source um, neural network approaches to binarize our system. Um, and what you can see is by using learning tools, um, we get slightly different images um, in terms of what is lithium, what is the identified phase of interest, the lithium metal versus um, the void. Um, and I will I'll go over this more in um, the next slide. Um, and But for those of you who are not um, x-ray tomographies, these are actually quite different. And I just want to draw your attention to here versus here. Um, You can see um, that this binarized segmentation um, looks very different. And while one um, slice alone is not going to break the bank, when you're looking at thousands and thousands of images, um, this is very statistically relevant. Uh, And so, um, again, this is the tomography image. This is the segmentation we get using um, human in the loop or kind of algorithms that exist, um, open source binarization um, algorithms. 
Um, this is the sample that we use um, with that first um, quantification. Um, and why are we interested in this? Well, um, if we can track where the pores form, um, which basically are going to be sites where ions are stripped out of the lithium metal, we can potentially look at the ionic flux at this interface um, and capture dynamics of ion transport. Um, in particular, we're interested in understanding how homogeneous is this stripping and plating um, behavior. Uh, and so uh, we ran um, um, on our 3D tomography experiments. We have um, gone through each of these images and looked at tracking um, the ionic flux um, at this interface. This is the lithium metal interface and the blue region is low flux and the yellow region is a high flux. One thing I want to bring to everyone's attention is we're making the move toward um, quantification of these images. Um, but what we try to emphasize is that um, the magnitude is not necessarily the most um, um, impactful um, quantity, but the trend is a much more reliable observation. And so just in a nutshell, what we're seeing across this lithium metal, which is a flat interface, we see a pretty um, a variety of ionic flux, um, which means that there's the presence of directed ion transport um, to this lithium metal interface. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, we want to have a uniform ionic flux so we don't have any irregularities or form in the deposition um, step or the formation of um, irregular interfaces for, through morphological um, irregular morphologies that exist. Um, and so what we have seen with this work is that we can track um, the ionic flux with spatial resolution using these x-ray images and it, it kind of get, gleans some insight into the impact of ionic, um, local ionic flux or directed ionic flux. Um, and so um, this kind of brings me to the next um, part of my talk um, where we're interested in understanding solid electrolyte properties, which may contribute to this directed ion um, ionic flux. Um, so we see at the lithium metal interface that we can, um, we have local places where we have high ionic flux and we have regions where we have low ionic flux. Um, and we want to know what about this interface? What about the lithium metal? And what about the solid electrolyte may um, be the reason why ions go from or prefer to go to one location over the other. Uh, and so uh, we have recently started working on, or over the last couple of years, we've been working on lithium thiophosphates, um, or these are sulfides. Um, and sulfides are great um, because it is a lot of push toward using them because they have very high ionic conductivity. Um, they are processed and don't require high pressure processing that garnet oxides have. Um, and um, they are pretty easy easy to synthesize. That being said, they do have their air stability challenges and their water stability challenges, as well as um, um, they um, require potentially a larger infrastructure for manufacturing. Um, but um, that part, that um, larger scale questions, I think, are still being answered at present. Um, but something that's interesting about these sulfides is while they're great, they have great transport properties, um, they are not chemically stable with lithium metal. Um, again, as I mentioned previously, the chemical potential is dissimilar, and so you can form these interphase regions, and these interphase regions are regions where they have dissimilar properties from the anode as a solid electrolyte. Um, and if this interface grows uncontrollably, um, you're going to have high over potentials um, as well as your potentially consumptive side effects. Um, and so these interfaces are um, not all bad though, if you can, if they are metastable and that they only, they're kinetically metastable where they don't grow uncontrollably. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in understanding um, the transport properties of these interfaces, um, as well as how they impact um, the chemomechanical properties of both um, the solid electrolyte and the lithium metal. Um, and so we have been really interested in understanding, interested in looking at how they fail. 
Um, and what about the microstructure of the solid electrolyte governs failure at lithium metal anode interfaces? Um, uh, and so um, unlike the oxides, which was the work that I was talking about um, in the lithium metal work previously, um, we see uh, these are much softer um, solid electrolytes and they can have these catastrophic fractures. Um, and so we were interested in understanding how the microstructure impacts failure. And so we designed an experimental um, protocol or um, a um, experimental protocol with different uh, materials we, where we process them to get different microstructures. And we modified the interface by adding a halogen or lithium iodine. Um, and so our Lithium thiophosphate that was amorphous is labeled A, LPS. And so this is just the powders in its bare form. Of course, it's been compressed um, and sintered. Um, and then we have LPS with lithium iodine. Um, iodine is known to diffuse to the surface um, and um, reside in the interphase. And so lithium iodide is a conductor. Um, so having the interphase being ion conducting is um, good um, for having a metastable interface and also for decreasing the overpotential. Um, to, sit, to change the microstructure, we looked at milling our samples to create smaller particle sizes, so high, higher packing densities. And we looked at a subsequent annealing process, again, to improve part density. Um, and so what we saw was that our sample that had been um, annealed had the highest ionic conductivity, um, whereas our system with the metal, metal, the unstable interface had the lowest ionic conductivity, um, and these two were in the middle. All samples had a transference number of one, which is unsurprisingly, and a pretty low activation energy for transport. Um, we did stability tasks where we stripped and plated lithium metal in a sandwich a symmetric cell. Um, and again, we saw that our, um, our samples with annealed um, had the high, most stability, um, whereas our, our sample with the interface, um, with the unstable interface failed fastest. And so to look at what was playing a role in terms of transport of these interface, um, we have collaborated with um, Toyota Research in North America, as well as University of Pennsylvania to do some in-situ TEM um, experiments um, where um, we can take a lithium metal probe um, and put it on our solid electrolyte and pull lithium out of the solid electrolyte um, or, um, or move lithium into, from the lithium metal probe to the solid electrolyte. And so we can observe um, these interactions at a very, very local uh, scale. And so this is just an image of the TEM of the lithium uh, probe um, and the solid electrolyte. Um, and I wanna, as I bring um, the context into, um, um, into contact, I just wanted to bring your attention to these greens. Um, and then if I pull lithium out with my probe, I see the formation of these voids um, that form at the interface. Um, and when I reverse the flow of current, I don't ever to like, reverse this mechan or this microstructural or morphological change at this interface. And upon taking um, the lithium metal probe out and doing EDX, I see the presence of well dispersed iodine in my lithium metal, which supports our hypothesis that iodine does indeed flow to the interface. Um, and it in fact flows into the lithium metal, which pro provides better readability of our lithium metal um, and suggests that the interface is ionically conducting. Um, but we also see um, this pore form um, that's an irreversible um, uh, entity at this solid upon, um, upon lithium metal contact. Um, and so uh, with x-ray tomography, what we have done was we, we cycled samples and tracked how the fracture event happened, both at the interface, but within the bulk. Um, and these are just the characteristic examples of what the failure looks like in the amorphous samples where we've only um, cycled a small amount of charge. And then our sample that was the most robust, which is our annealed and um, annealed and attrition 
milled sample with the higher density part. And so you can see that there's a drastically different fracture pattern um, depending on the mechanical properties of the solid electrolytes. Um, but something we saw across all samples, and this was kind of brought to the light with the TEM, was that upon contact, we see this edge chipping dynamic that we see in all samples. And this is kind of located by in the x-ray tomography data here. Um, so we see this chipping effect that occurs at the lithium metal interface independent of the material we use, uh, followed by this transverse crack that grows from one chipping um, site to another chipping site. Um, and so this edge chipping is um, indicative of this current focusing that we saw with the garnet oxides, um, which suggests that independent of the material properties, we still have um, this edge chipping or the current focusing is a significant issue um, that may be overcome either through temperature or pressure control. Um, but to understand how the solid electrolyte microstructure governed that transverse fracture, um, we looked at creating this structure factor, which took the por local porosity at a single location over the average porosity over an entire control volume uh, minus one. Um, and so if you map the top looking down on your solid electrolyte, the red region is regions that are more dense, whereas the blue regions are regions that are um, less dense. Um, and this is our amorphous sample. Um, and this is our attrition, and, attrition uh, sample, and this is our annealed sample. And so the microstructure is changing as we move across and look at all these samples. Um, and what you can see is the subsequent fracture growth uh, for each of these samples. And so what we saw with samples with the most microstructural heterogeneity um, led to the most severe uh, fracture um, throughout the um, solid electrolyte, suggesting that the microstructure, the subsurface region of the solid electrolyte, that microstructure heterogeneity does play a role in terms of uh, the ultimate, fail ultimate failure of these solid electrolytes. Uh, and lastly, what we did was we cycled lithium metal back and forth and we tracked this porous region, and um, which is basically um, uh, tracking, uh, we can track the lithium metal as it plates and strips, and this is the blue electrode and this is the green electrode. Um, and then we, we capture or track the porous or the lithium metal within the bulk. Um, and what we could see is that if you go from, this is one, our initial time when we start plating, um, the void increases, which means that we're filling that with lithium metal or the crack is growing um, over 0.3. And then in 0.4, where we reverse the flow of the current, um, we saw a decrease, which means that potentially um, the lithium metal is infilling into these cracks and remains active. And so as we reverse the flow, um, that crack might um, diminish in size, which is given by this cartoon here, um, and basically suggesting that lithium metal, um, even in these voids or cracks, is potentially still active. Um, uh, but again, with this work, what we've highlighted is that like, um, edge chipping is a big problem in independent of the microstructure, um, and that seems to be the origin of fracture. Um, however, if we can suppress these edge chipping factors, which might be, be able to be suppressed with pressure, uh, we still have to contend with the ultimate fracture um, uh, through the transverse fracture event, which is likely going to be governed by the microstructure of the solid electrolyte. Um, and having a uniform um, microstructure is going to be important um, for uh, dampening this catastrophic failure mechanism. Uh, so what we see is that the interface um, governs time to failure to some extent, um, but isn't limiting in the metastable, um, metas metastable interface. Um, the microstructure um, is directly related to the critical current density and crack formation. Uh, and reversible lithium metal is um, possible even within um, fracture events. And so uh, the lithium metal is potentially active longer than we expect. 
Um, and so uh, just to close out this talk, I want to just finish up by saying um, some of my work on how we can scale these battery manufacturing systems up um, and potential pathways toward that. Um, and one of the biggest challenges with solid state batteries in particular is that we're competing with a battery that works well, which is just the conventional lithium ion battery, um, where we know how to make that battery at very, very large scales. Uh, and so in looking at solid state batteries, it's helpful to look at um, solid oxide fuel cells, if you're looking at oxides, um, and conventional lithium ion batteries, because most likely the pathway toward making solid state batteries is going to be a hybrid of both of these techniques. Um, and so usually, um, people use um, coating methods um, like slot dye to manufacture um, batteries, um, whereas in solid oxide fuel cells, typically it's tape casting or screen printing. Um, and so as you can see, um, the, depending on the technique that you choose to process, um, films will be highly dependent on the material you choose, um, but this, the magnitude and there's gonna be trade-offs in terms of the process speed as well as the cost. Uh, and so we recently have been looking at doing cost modeling for uh, battery manufacturing to look at where solid state battery manufacturing um, exists um, now, today, um, and where the opportunities exist. Um, and what you can see here is the breakdown in different material parts in terms of the valuation, um, in terms of materials, machines, and building, labor, overhead, energy, maintenance. And what you can see is there's a strong correlation between as we decrease the process speed, we decrease the cost of materials. And so, um, uh, but that comes at the cost of machine and building. You, you're gonna be having, if you're processing um, solid state batteries or batteries slowly, your equipment is going to have to run for twice the amount of time. You're gonna need a lot more labor and overhead. Um, and so um, one of the, this is where we see in comparing um, solid state battery manufacturing to lithium ion, um, we see there's a significant gains to be made if we can process um, solid electrolytes quickly. Um, but secondly, um, we uh, this this analysis is done for a not energy dense anode, um, and so solid state batteries can, can be competitive if we use um, fast processing speeds if you employ a lithium metal anode. Uh, and so the question is, how can we get to these process speed? People would say 50 to 100 million um, meters per minute is way outside the scope of where solid state batteries are right now. Um, and probably the best way to do this is to um, combine inorganic materials with polymers um, because polymers ha have well, um, very mature um, processing approaches. Uh, and there's also the added benefit in terms of the energy density in terms of getting a form factor that's uh, reliable. And so what this, a battery that combines two ion conductors is kind of, um, ion conductors is known as a hybrid solid electrolyte. And what I'm highlighting here is how the energy density of a battery cell um, decreases with solid electrolyte thickness. And so most solid electrolytes that people are working with are way above 200, 500, or even a millimeter in thickness. And so if you're below this line, um, there's basically no point to having a solid state battery. We ideally want to exceed the state of the art. And so we need to be looking at thin electrolytes that are going to be 100 microns or thinner um, in most cases to, again, achieve energy densities that are better than the, the state of the art. Uh, and the only way we're going to do that most likely um, is by combining a polymer with a inorganic. Um, um, Unfortunately, these systems by just mixing an inorganic material or with a polymer um, leads to this property called a hybrid penalty. Um, so this is an all inorganic solid electrolyte, the ionic conductivity. Um, this is the all polymer. Um, and when we mix them together, um, especially at low temperatures, um, we don't even, we don't get even close to the transport properties that we get in a hybrid um, cell. Uh, and so my group has been looking at 
um, the properties of these hybrid solid electrolytes um, and what makes them effective um, in terms of adding um, a cathode onto it. Uh, and so we looked at changing the, looking at the mechanics, mechanical properties and, and in particular, the extrinsic interfacial properties between the electrode and electrolyte to understand um, what allows for long-term cycling of these solid electrolytes. Um, and so we started looking at lithium iron phosphate um, and we used identical solid hybrid electrolytes, but the only thing we did was we changed the mechanical properties of the polymer, changing from 300 to 5 million, um, the molecular weight of our polymer. We saw significantly different performances in terms of capacity. Uh, to make sure that this wasn't governed by the microstructure of the cathode, um, we calculate the diffusion coefficient um, using both X-ray images of the um, X-ray images of the cathode, as well as doing galvanostatic intermittent titration, and we didn't see significantly different um, um, diffusion coefficients in the cathode, suggesting that it really was that interfacial uh, the properties of the solid electrolyte at the as it interfaces um, the cathode that really drives. Um, um, how effective um, a cathode is in cycling. Um, and so in collaboration with um, Nina Balk um, at um, uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, although she's going to um, NC State this summer, um, we looked at prop mapping properties at the interface of a hybrid electrolyte. Namely, we were interested in morphology, um, adhesion, uh, and in particular, Young's moduli. And what you can see is that the roughness changes pretty significantly as we change the molecular weight, um, but the adhesion properties really didn't change for each molecular weight. Um, but what is interesting is when we just map the Young's modulus versus the um, uh, the Young's modulus versus adhesion, what we started to see is just a large heterogeneity in properties as you went across the domain of the hybrid solid electrolytes. Um, and how you can reconcile this is if you look at, this is the hybrid electrolyte where we don't have much control over where the inorganic particles are arranged. If we look at quantifying um, the regions where it's our high density, meaning the inorganic particles to the polymer, um, we see this great heterogeneity that exists, again, in terms of mechanical properties. We have a hard oxide and a polymer. Um, and this leads to this large range in mechanical properties, um, which we think is going to be rather significant with um, engineering these devices and again, avoiding current focusing um, that we see in solid state batteries. Uh, and just to kind of close this off, um, we see like by doing a simulation where we've applied a five megapascal pressure on a small region in our polymer electrolyte, we saw that we have large stress distributions that can occur within hybrid electrolyte, which is something that um, can affect stress-driven transport in these systems, and that's something that definitely needs to be overcome, um, potentially with controlled processing um, and um, both um, tailoring the electrolyte microstructure for these hybrid solid electrolytes. So just um, some conclusions here, because I know I'm wrapping up, I wanna, don't want to go over time, um, but we think that um, image analysis is something that we've been working on um, in, as it's, it relates to solid state batteries. And um, we're getting to quantitative um, uh, observations. Um, as always, trends are more reliable than absolute values. Um, there's a lot of unknown about the physics and chemistry that reside at lithium metal solid electrolyte interfaces. Um, we see that the microstructure does play a role in terms of catastrophic failure. Um, interfaces are always going to be an, a challenge, um, but we see that they're not going to be um, unsurmountable if they're metastable and they have good transport properties. And finally, um, solid state batteries are really all the rage right now, but we have to know how to make them and um, potentially going toward um, potentially using existing infrastructures is the fastest way to get solid state batteries into the market. Um, and with that, 
Um, I um, can take questions, acknowledging that most of this work was done by Wahid Marm Dixit um, and Wahid Zaman, um, two of my graduate students. And um, I can take questions if there's questions with the remaining time.